four. Organization. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planters Earth Augers, the official digging tools. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour, whether you're listening through your radio on one of the 16 stations that is broadcasting our program here in 2020, through a radio app, through our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com containing season one, two, three, and all of four, and over uh, about 1,600 how to garden videos, as well as in studio video, in, in studio videos. We, uh, you can check that out at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. You can get a hold of us in a couple of different ways. First of all, this program is for you, about you, to help your grass grows grass grow greener, your trees to grow stronger, your vegetables to grow healthier, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. You can get a hold of us, coast to coast, toll free at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW, or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We've got a big show lined up for you today. This is the, uh, we got one more week after today and we are completed for season four and we will return for season five and we'll give you all that information next week. We're going to talk about today common and uncommon gardening practices or methods in which to grow produce. In segment two, growing your own teas, herbs, and spices. We're going to go over uh, what you may not know there, as well as canning diva Diana Derox De- De- will be with us. Devereaux Devere- Devere- will be with us, mm-hmm. plus your garden questions. So let's get in the program. First of all, Holly, kind of chilly in the studio today. That means uh, winter is getting closer, um, at, and there's some places that are listening to us in their car with their air conditioner on, screaming at us because it's not cold where they're at. <laughs> Yeah, I heard some parts of the south are are quite warm still, so really hanging on the summer there. But we are definitely moving into in the northern portions of the country. We're yeah, into the the fall, or we're in the fall, and uh, winter will is <clears throat> probably here sooner than we think. So, um, we're, are we gonna ta- yeah, we're going to talk about different types of common and uncommon gardening methods. And you know, you think, oh, well, I know all of them. Well, good, uh, but there's many gardeners who are, have gardened for the very first time this year. Uh, that are not aware that there are so many, and we're just going to cover. Uh, we, I got we've got about fourteen or fifteen on the list here that we're going to try to go over. There are dozens of different types of particular methods in which people can grow produce indoors, outdoors, and year round. Right. So I think the one the one that we can talk about is uh, hugel culture. Well, well, let's go through the common ones first. Let's not just ditch them oh, and go. Okay. Oh, you're you're common folks. So we're just going to no ground gardening. Is a, the traditional ground gardening is a, is what many people do. A container gardening, those of you who are not able to dig in the ground. And container gardening uh, can be a multitude of devices. Uh, you can go on the balcony or the patio, porch, deck, apartment, whatever you want to do with that. You can certainly do it that way. Raised beds are, is another easy way to I do just, such. I just want to say this about yeah. container gardening. Maybe you can dig in your ground and you're just like, I don't want to, I don't want to explore that. Or maybe you just, <clears throat> you want to. You have, don't have good soil. You don't have good soil. Maybe you don't have the correct sunlight in a certain area. That's definitely something. Or you, you just would. don't, you want to do a little, but you don't want to do a lot. So instead of constructing raised beds or digging up the backyard, you get a couple of grow bags from rootmaker.com and, and use coupon code TWVG and save 10% on your order. And, and you construct those on the back, uh, in the backyard or next yeah. to the fence. 
Right. So container gardening, I know people think, oh, it's just, you know, for people with apartments or who don't have a big yard, but it is a great option for many people. Many people have all those and do container gardening as well. Right. Raised beds and a little more of an investment, whether you purchase a raised bed from Rootmaker, you make your own elevated or on the ground, whatever the case is, a pretty, pretty easy one. Straw bales. Some people are not aware that you can grow in straw bales. Uh, author of the Straw Bell Garden Book, the complete garden book, Joel Karsten, he's been on the program every year uh, of this program. He talks about how you can grow in a straw bale. And it's not just put the straw bale on the ground and plant it. There's a conditioning process that goes through. You can certainly uh, search our website for his interview if you want to learn more about that particular method. Hydroponics and aquaponics. These are two that are that utilize water, but in a very, very different means. Hydroponics uses chemicals, or uh, they are chemicals, let's call it what it is. They're, they're not necessarily organic, but it, it is, it's water that you mix the chemicals in, and the plants, the water cycles under and through the roots of the plants, and the plants uptake what they need. Now, also, there's it's a... Kind, it's kind of like like um, something you would feed the water of your, like the plants of your fish tank, basically. Right. So it's not like, it's not like you're putting... Well, there's two types. There's super, a pump type where it folds, uh, pumps through and there's also a stagnant, like a passive, a yeah. passive, a, a mm-hmm. passive uh, hydroponics where the water's stagnant and the plants grow in that means. Aquaponics, on the other hand, is the method of using water in that similar type of situation, typically outside or outside of your home, and then they use fish in the in the water, and they pump the fish water through the plants, and the waste of the fish feed the plants, and it's kind of a two for one deal there. And based on the type of fish, some people will harvest the fish after a certain duration and, and eat them. Um, and it's a kind of a, a, a little cycle there of things. Now let's talk about uh, right before we get to hugo culture. Let's talk about we can indoor grow. Indoor growing can be done very simply with a south facing window. Underneath a Happy Leaf LED grow light, they are made in America, very powerful, one of the best things that we've ever gotten a hold of. And you can grow anything indoors, literally anything with a Happy Leaf LED light because of the light spectrum and the power and the understanding of what the plant's requiring by the creator of the Happy Leaf. So we've gone, we've grown all kinds of things indoors with that light from seed starting all the way up to beans and radishes and, and tomatoes and that type of thing. And, and they've got a great bunch of videos on their website. Now we can get to the Hugo culture. What, what is a Hugo culture? People have, people think that's like some kind of German hot dog or something, maybe. <laughs> well, I think it is a German word. I'm pretty sure, but it's a horticultural technique where you take a mound constructed from decaying wood. Debris and other compostable biomass material, and what you do is you you get this like raised bed, well, yeah, a hill, like a hill, like yeah, a hill, yeah, 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 and um, and you don't and people will actually it t- will help your soil fertility, right? People will construct this above ground and then they basically an arch of soil, yeah. Uh, other people will dig down and bury the wood and then create that arch. What is occurring? In, in layman's terms, is as the wood rots, it absorbs like a sponge. And then when the soil needs the water, it releases the water to the soil, and the plants are growing on both sides of the arched hill. Now, these can be very small, one foot high to three foot high, and even the Native Americans and other um, Europeans would come over and build 30 or 40 or 50 foot high mounds and just basically have a garden on the side of a mountain, essentially, is what, what it would be kind of looking like. But it's all soil. And the date, then the, the, the matter is breaking down, feeding the soil as well as releasing water, uh, in the, so, in, in, to the soil. Right. And, the, um, wood itself is, since it's very porous, it absorbs a lot of water. And so it does have that sponge like effect, especially as it, as it breaks down. And then we have the back to Eden garden method, which everybody, eh, kind of thinks that, okay, you just throw some wood chips on the ground and you plant in them, and that's simply not how the procedure is supposed to be exercised. The wood chips, you put a a substantial depth amount of wood chips, 8, 12, 13 inches, and then you let it set there for a duration of time, and the lower levels begin to break down, and then you plant kind of in that material when you have broke down material. Now, if you use wood chips and then you plant in them, you're basically just using wood chips as mulch. It's you're you're not utilizing the actual practice of back to Eden, a gardening method. 
Right. So, yeah, you basically what happens is that you the wood chips are breaking down. They're kind of like hookah culture. They're breaking down. They're deca- the, decaying. They're becoming different biomass. And then you have this effective growing medium mm-hmm. area, whatever you want to call it. And it's it's I shouldn't say it's the same as hookah culture, but it's it's a similar concept. And it's, a, it's creating your own your own fertile soil that is nice to grow in. And the brief description which we are giving these is just a brief description. There's a lot of studying and a lot of videos in which from reputable YouTubers and other websites in which will instruct you on the proper procedures and steps in which to be successful at all of these types of methods. So another one we have here is called Wallapini. I think that's how you I would that's how say, I would pronounce yeah. it. W A L I P I N I. So basically, um, and what is this technique of growing food? You're basically growing an underground greenhouse. So it's like a pit. You've you've extracted a certain square or, or large, whatever the size. You've extracted it, and it's an eight, nine, ten foot deep pit with a roof over it. Yeah. And then you've taken that topsoil in which you which would have been on top, and you bring it down and you put it at the base, and that keeps in that it pit. warm. And it keeps it warm. It, it's a very it's an it's um. It's a, con- a controlled environment. I'm just thinking about, you know, how we grow in my mom's backyard. Right. We say, Mom, we're going to do this and see uh-huh. what she says. It, well, essentially, it's what it is. It's, you dig a basement and you put a greenhouse roof yeah, over top what... of it and, it, and it keeps the temperature during the coldest portions of the winter about 60, 65 degrees. But then during summer, do you do this during summer? You can do it during summer. However... Uh, the temperature at, at that depth is still going to be moderate. You're probably not going to be able to grow the pumpkins and the, the tomatoes and the watermelons because there's not enough heat. It's a very – because in the basement all year long, it's cool. It's cool, right? Yeah. So yeah. this is a great method to, to utilize. Now, maybe I don't I, – we've never practiced this or, or don't know uh, many uh, anyone who does. Maybe you remove the roof and allow the heat to go down into it at that point. I don't know. But it's a really n- unique way, in, especially in the northern climates, to grow during the winter months. By just digging a hole or a, a basement, essentially, and putting a roof on top of it. Right. I think it's very unique as well. And that comes from South America. Right. Um, so then we have the greenhouse slash low tunnel, high tunnel, or cold frame. Right. Gardening. So greenhouse is typically more of a structure mm-hmm. versus a high tunnel, which is a structure, but it's made out of some sort of uh, framing it, it's a, with tip, plastic. It's some type of hoop in some instances. Yeah. And yeah. you can usually... You can usually walk into it. Right. Low tunnel is a is a less cl- a, less. It's smaller, smaller. and less climate con- con- controllable. The high tunnel you usually have some means of more control over the temperature, whether hot or cold, in it. Uh, than than and then a greenhouse is a greenhouse. We're all familiar with that. And then cold frames. Cold frames are wooden structures or devices sat on top of wo- of raised beds in which. To extend the season, whether early or late, in order to uh, trick the soil and the plants thinking that it's warmer than what it really is. So that's just a handful of some common and maybe some of them that you were not aware of existed when the types of unique growing situations. And we practice many of those at our garden. You can find those on our videos on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com website, as well as the same name. On YouTube, ground gardening, container gardening, raised bed, straw bale. Uh, we've dabbled in hydroponics. We've dabbled in uh, cold frames uh, and low tunnels. So we've all we've, we've tried a little bit of all of that as well. So, yep. So thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our thirty fourth show of twenty twenty. Did you miss last week's show? We had talked about winter composting and spring garden preps that you can do right now. Our guest was author Paula Crawford. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we'll make it even easier. You can find um, them, send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and in the subject line, put show 33, and we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about growing your own teas, spices, and herbs. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, and make that grass look greener, preserving what you grow for in or out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your 
your trees look sad? When we here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens have a tree or shrub issue, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil. So you can grow stronger plants, chemical-free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on your face and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Trim bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Have you ever thought about possibly making your own tea, growing your own herbs, the legal kind, as well as... Spices. Well, we're going to cover all of that here in the next uh, handful of minutes uh, to enlighten you and bring forth some knowledge that maybe you're not fully aware of exists and what you can do in your own backyard or in containers. So teas are, um, are getting more popular, Holly, and there are certain things in which one can do in order to make their own teas. However, it kind of depends on how the plant grows in the area in which you live when it comes to the type of plant in order to make the tea. We're talking about physically growing a plant and getting the leaves and making the tea all in one swoop and not have to go to the store for tea. Right. So there's this plant. It's a tea plant. And it, grows, <laughs> it grows actually in zone eight. So if you don't live in zone eight, you can grow it like in a, on a, patio or whatever. In a, in a container or in a greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just bring it in it during winter. Right. Um, so it's called the Camellia sinensis plant. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, so it's a small shrub. Now it does get about three to seven feet in height. So you can prune it back or whatever, but it's not like 
uh, you know, like a little house plant. Right. It can get three feet tall. So you might have to prepare for that. But the cool thing about it is it's depending on how you process the leaves, you can grow uh, green tea, black tea, or oolong tea. Three and one. Mm-hmm. Three and one. And, um, yeah, so it, it does, it likes um, a little bit more of acidic soil and a little bit more of sandy soil, so a little bit more porous Kind of, so, kind of like tropical to a certain degree if you got that sandy yeah. sandy soil. Yeah. So then, yeah, so you grow this. Um, some people will add something like uh, a moss to the mix to to give it the... Water retention. Yeah. And it can take up to three years before you might start harvesting leaves if you drink a lot of tea. So you might have some few leaves at first, but then at a certain point you'll have more than you need. So, like, how would we process, let's just pick green tea. How would we process that just to give the, the listeners some idea of what, what steps are involved in such such a procedure? So what you would do is you would, so this is a, a whole process, but you pluck the youngest leaves so and the leaf buds, and then you would let you would let them dry in the shade for a few hours, and then you steam the leaves. So you steam them like you would steam vegetables, like okay. broccoli or something. Uh-huh. And then... Um, you can spread them on a baking sheet and then dry them in the oven at 250 for 20 minutes. And then at that point, you would grind them or whatever, and then you can store them. And you can get, uh, correct me here, you can get the tea bags and then pack them with your own flavors, right? Yeah. Okay. So, like, say you grow, like, lemon balm. Right. So you could take your lemon balm, and then you would take your green tea leaves, and then you take the the tea ball or tea okay, the whatever tea, yeah, bags, yeah. yeah, and then you have your own tea. And the tea ball versus the bags, is there advantage to one or the other? I mean, I guess the tea bags is one time use the tea ball. It looks like uh, kind of like a, a smaller version of a ping pong ball that opens up and you pack it. And right, you, and they have all sorts of ones now. They have ones that look like manatees and aliens and uh, robots. But they're all and, the same size, aren't they? Are they different volumes? Um, It's just for like one cup. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that that's you know just a, a brief thing about tea. I thought that was kind of interesting that you can make your own tea. You don't have to rely on some foreign country or farm far away in order to uh, make some tea. Obviously, if you're going to drink a lot of tea, uh, some investment is uh, needed for this. I think it's kind of cool if you drink a lot of tea. Well, and even it's... if you just have it in the corner, like if you have it a three season or four season porch, you could have that in that corner mm-hmm. and, and do the necessary requirements for it. And you could have your own tea plant. It's a pretty plant. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about herbs. Growing your own herbs, the legal kind based on the state that you live in. We're not going to take uh, the, the <laughs> cannabis route, but people do grow right, that right. for a variety of health and recreational purposes. Yeah. Uh, but herbs, I guess, if somebody said, hey, I want to grow herbs, what is the easiest or what would you recommend? I would say basil, sage, and um, what would you say? What would be another one? Basil, sage... Oregano. Oregano would be mm-hmm. an easy one. Thyme. We all need thyme, so we need yeah, to grow some. Yeah, we all need thyme. Um, now, the thing with basil, it's not just your grandma, grandmother's big, large leaf, green Italian basil. There's about 16 or 20 different flavors of actual basil. Chocolate, uh, licorice, uh, lime, lemon. Um, what am I missing? There's a whole bunch of them there that, that di- you didn't know existed. I mean, there's chocolate basil. Yeah, it ta- tastes like chocolate. Licorice, it tastes like licorice. Uh, lemon and lime, yep, tastes just like those. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of different varieties in which you can grow. Um, obviously, if you're uncertain if you're going to like something, you want to try to find somebody who has a familiar, uh, has a plant that has that f- uh, flavor to it. Now, I guess it would be if you had, you know, lemon balm tea mm-hmm. would be, you know, you can grow lemon balm. Uh, if you had your own tea plant, then you could grow lemon basil and counteract and use that instead of a lemon wedge. You could do that. Uh, but yeah, herbs, they need, they need based on, well, rosemary is a very popular one. Rosemary, the, the, the thing a lot of people have difficulty with, with rosemary is it begins to die. And that's because they're overwatering it. Basil is a very unique herb in which it likes to get a lot of water and then go through a dry cycle. And this is definitely uh, in containers uh, that you've got to let that dry cycle occur. Otherwise, you get root rot, and that's what kills the plant. Uh, you can also take on almost virtually any herb. You can propagate it by cuttings and extend your plant. That's what we did for a number of years. We would get a rosemary plant, and then we'd just take cuttings off of it, root it in water, then plant it, 
and we carried on that uh, a great That's deal. That's for like probably six years, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, but growing herbs in containers on your pat, pat, porch patio deck inside, uh, next to the kitchen window. We've done that for a number of years, worked very well. Uh, so it's, they're very versatile. And the thing with herbs is you do not need full sun. Obviously they will grow great in full sun. However, if you, if you only have three, four, four and a half, five hours of sun, most herbs will do pr- very, very good with just that limited amount of sunlight. Uh, they're very versatile in that, uh, when it comes to that. And there's just again, name an herb. There's a, uh, there's a lot of herbs that you can grow and pretty much anywhere in the country. Uh, based on where you're at, some of them are perennials. They will come back year after year. Other ones based on the cold temperatures, they are annuals. I think, um, one that's becoming more popular is lemongrass. Yes. And, um, because a lot of people use it in different cooking and then also just in their own, you know, flavoring their own tea. And we grow that really easily. And it looks like a giant piece of grass. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, smells, it bunches together. Yeah. It smells really good. Uh, and, and it yeah. doesn't come back year after year for us because we're in too cold of a climate. Uh, but yeah, you just cut it back and it has the fragrance of lemon, uh, very, very easily. And I think that's kind of, where years and years ago before lemons and pineapple and all of this stuff was so available at your local grocery store, that's where your our ancestors or grandparents utilized these type of plants in order to get the fragrance that they didn't have available to them, such as a lemon or a lime or licorice. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So we can talk about some spices you can yeah. grow. Um, I, want, one- I want to talk about mustard because mustard is easy to grow and you can make your own mustard at home in the water bath canner and you've done this yeah yeah we made i made i've made mustard yeah um so mustard you grow it's kind of like it's a it's a plant (laughs) obviously you don't say (laughs) you're growing the seed so what's what's happening is if you live in a climate where you grow mustard um and, yeah, mustard is an easy crop, crop to grow. You're growing the seed. You're using the seed as the actual plant or the item in which you're turning in to the actual mustard. And it's, So it's going to be a mustard plant. Right. And so you want the plant to bolt, essentially, so uh-huh. you can get the seed. In this and instance, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, and that's what that's what you're doing. So same thing with cilantro. If your cilantro bolts, then you get coriander seed, right. which is the, the seed for the cilantro. But anyway, talk about the, the ease of mustard now, because people are unfamiliar that you can make your own, you can can your own mustard. Yeah, so mustard, you just get your mustard seeds, you cook them down, you puree them, and then you can add flavoring, whether there be like, most people sometimes will add like a cherry, honey, cranberry, cranberry, um, even beer, mm-hmm. and you make you follow that recipe, and then you add a little vinegar. You can, put, you can put beer mustard on your beer brats while drinking beer. Yeah. Okay. That's very Wisconsin. Uh huh. So yeah, <laughs> you cook it down, you puree it, and then you add the flavor, whatever you're adding, and then you add some vinegar and you can it, and it's really tasty. Well, another spice in which you can grow, and we planted it uh, just a couple of weeks ago, was garlic. Uh, you can plant garlic. You can make, you know, dry garlic powder from garlic. That you know, many people use the fresh garlic. You can get your garlic from Big Elk Garlic Farm. dot com, a uh, great farm there in Pennsylvania, ships across the country, and you can actually take your garlic that you harvest it in spring, grind it up, dry it out, and turn it into garlic powder. It, it's very easy to do. If you have leftover garlic that's not good enough to plant or you're trying to get rid of the old stuff before you bring in the new stuff in the spring, make garlic powder out of it. works very, very well, uh, and it's so potent a uh, fragrance compared to the store-bought stuff that you're familiar with. What what else well, do we have here? Um, so we also have, let's see here. We've got lavender. Yeah, lavender. We, we've we tried growing lavender. Uh, lavender is a unique uh, plant that sometimes if it likes you, it'll grow very well for you. And other times it, it doesn't grow very good. But there's a lot of things in which you can do with lavender, not only the flower, but also the, the, the stems for the fragrance. And the people make potpourri out of it. Uh, they will actually cook with it uh, as well. Put in tea. Put in tea, lavender tea. It's very relaxing. Uh, dill is another very popular one. And based on your um, environmental, uh, in, your location, can be uh, labeled as an invasive species, species uh, invasive plant because of the vigorous 
that the plant produces, the seeds. We planted dill in our front yard garden containers about uh, 10 years ago, and it went to seed, and we transitioned the containers to a ground garden, and we've still never had to plant dill because we just get dill all over the place. And a couple of years, we ended up doing a uh, experiment, and we got one gallon, two half gallon mason jars full of clean dill seed, and we didn't even make a dent in it. No, dill is definitely very, very aggressive. Um, so another, yeah. So it's if you do grow it, you might you want to be mindful of where you're putting it. Uh, ca- ca- cayenne peppers. Yeah, you can make your own cayenne hot sauce or not your hot uh, powders, powder, uh, chili powder. Certainly do it that way. Um, very easily to do so. Just grow hot peppers, let them dry out, grind them up. Be sure you're careful of where you're drying it. If you put it, if you put cayenne peppers or habaneros or jalapenos or ghost peppers in a dehydrator to dry, be sure you do it in a garage, a ventilated area, in a shed. Don't do it in the kitchen whenever you uh, have family over because it will burn everybody's eyes out. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is an also a very unique way and a good safe way in order to get relatives to leave during the holidays if they're staying too long. Hey, uh, we're just going to grind up some chili here and we're going to dry this out and burn all your eyes out. Another one. See you next year. <laughs> Another one is juniper berries. Yes. Okay. And that's growing on the juniper bush. And yeah, I guess it's really easy to grow. And then you're harvesting the berries and then you're doing whatever you need to do with it. Um, a lot of times that's how gin is made, but also, uh, cause juniper does have a kind of a earthy, piney mm-hmm. flavor. So that is one, one that you could, you could grow. And it was, it's a very pretty, Bluish berry. Uh, this, these are just some, and, and I'll give you a little tip here. If you are wanting to try this, that's great. But if you're wanting to just, you know, utilize your garden for other uh, more uh, easily grown vegetables, such as beans, tomatoes, fill in the blank, and you want to purchase your spices, you want to go to a spice shop. Or if your grocery store has a bulk area of spices, that typically has the fresher spices in it, even though it's ground up in bulk. The the turnaround on that is much quicker, and it's cheaper to buy in bulk because sometimes you have a recipe that needs two tablespoons, and then you buy this whole bottle of stuff for like 8 $9, and you never use it again. So look at the bulk materials. Uh, go to your spice shop that you have if you have one available. Uh, that's a better, util- a better way in order to, to buy spices th- for the freshness. After a certain period of time, herbs uh, or spices in the grocery store in those containers lose their um, they're, they're done. So, so spices, herbs, and teas are things in which you can grow. In your garden. Well, another thing that is growing in your garden, and whether you want it to or not, is those Japanese beetles. So there's uh, this fall is here, winter is near, and the Japanese beetles are not far away. And you have forgotten about your lawn, which where is where they're currently uh, living. Yeah, just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards. And those Japanese beetles, they may be gone, but they're not far. They, you know, feasted on your roses and berries this summer. They laid eggs on your turf so they can start again next year. You want to take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scare pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granular with a spreader, irrigate it into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, but it is the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls grubs And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to bees and other pollinators and beneficial insects. In fact, GrubGone has zero label restrictions for you to use around your flowering plants so you don't have to get on your knees or hands and knees to remove dandelions or other flowers before application. To find more out about GrubGone, go to Phylum Bioproducts. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M Bioproducts.com, the natural choice. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's the Canning Diva. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. 
planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Well, the chill is in the air, and that means fall is almost over and winter is nearly here. However, Blue Mail's Landscape and Garden Center still has bulk material available for you up to the end of the month. So you can either have it delivered, or if you have the right equipment, you can go and get it purchased, whether you're looking for gravel, sand, wood chips, compost, or a variety of other items. They have 40 varieties to pick from in the bulk material category, largest selection in the Milwaukee area. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. Visit them online at bluemills.com, or you can visit them at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. That's bluemills.com. Get your bulk material now so you can have it ready and finish those projects you've been looking to get done. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Yeah, Diane Devereaux is also known. She's also known as the Canning Diva. She's very passionate about canning, where your food comes from, and storing the harvest. Her book, Canning Full Circle, is full of great canning information. And her newer book, Beginner's Guide to Canning, 90 Easy Recipes to Can, Savor, and Gift, came out this spring. How do you, how, welcome to the show, uh, Diane. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and all of our listeners and, and educate all of us uh, with with canning here. And I want to start out with how did you get into canning and, and where did the passion about canning come from? Did you find it as a child or later on in life? No, um, actually, this is something uh, that I have been doing since I was a teenager, so it's it's kind of funny. I grew up in inner city Detroit, and when I was a preteen, uh, moved to northern Michigan, and we moved to a hog farm that also had beef, cattle, sheep, chicken, you name it. And we had a two-acre garden, which we used to um, live off of. And so part of growing something that large is also finding ways in which to preserve it. So it was at a young age that I learned how to can food, and it's something that's just always stayed with me, especially when I became a mom. Um, I wanted to provide um, healthy food for my family, and um, I learned early on to explore with different flavors and seasonings and such because um, what I was shown was wonderful but limited. So I've been expanding upon that for the last couple decades. Now, as as a young individual, young woman, uh, was it? Uh, what did your friends think? They th- did they think that you were crazy, or did they find that this was like a really cool thing that you were you were experimenting and learning how to preserve your own food? Actually, it was probably the norm. I mean, all of us were up in farm country, and in some way, you know, our families were all doing this. Um, for me, it was probably the most bizarre because I came from the city. And moved up to the country and, and, uh, you know, I probably had more catching up to do than anyone, but 
I, I gravitated towards it. I became very passionate, um, you know, from a growing standpoint, being on the farm. Um, you know, I started my own garden when I was 15, in addition to what we had as a family. And, um, yeah, it just became a real passion um, for, for me, uh, seeing it full circle. Uh, it's part of the reason I, I, I donned my book that, you know, Canning Full Circle. And I, and I was really passionate about from the garden to the jar, you know, to the table. So, Certainly, definitely. Now well, we, well, Holly was a city girl too. Now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we always tell people that canning is a science, and it's important to can safely and be aware. Why is it important to can safely? Well, I mean, canning is it. it it's basically a craft. I mean, you're using science and math, but I think sometimes that's what. Um, the tours people is they think it's something so scientific or so you have to like be a scientist and and that's not the case there's a lot of really easy safe methodologies and technologies that we can use and obviously we've come a long way since canning started because this has been this has been going on this is nothing new preserving food in glass jars has been happening since the napoleon era so um if anything we have a lot of history to expand upon and it, you really have to work hard at making it unsafe. Um, you follow some tried and true recipes and, uh, you know, get the basics down and you're good to go. It, it really isn't as scary or as unsafe or, or difficult as some individuals like to make it. So it's important to be safe, of course, because you don't want to, um, you know, create something that's going to spoil or God forbid, if there happens to be a botulism spore in the jar, which is also very hard to do. Um, you know, you really have to work hard at making this, this difficult and, and scary, but you know, you want to follow safe practices and methodologies just to give yourself that peace of mind. Plus it, it's a lot easier to just do it right the first time, you know? Well, absolutely. And I'm sure you've seen on social media as we have people will, tell how they canned a certain item and you and I and we all cringe because we know that is nowhere close to how it was supposed to be done. But they're so proud of it and they've done it for 37 years and none of them got sick yet. And I'm like, well, good luck to you because that is totally upside down and backwards and you're not supposed to do it that way. Well, yeah, I mean, but I'm the type of educator. I don't tell people to fix what's not broken because if it's worked for 37 years, <laughs> good, good job. Keep going. Well, well, but, yeah, what, what, when I teach, yeah, I, I, I follow the, the recommended guidelines. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say that, that a listener has a, a, an old recipe from a, a, a past, like an aunt or a grandmother. Let's say it's a mm -hmm. pasta recipe and they want to can it. Can you mm -hmm. just go ahead and can that as the recipe states or does one need to adjust? adjust it or get it certified or make sure that recipe is still safe today well that's the, that's the kind of the i don't want to say misnomer but there's a lot of misinformation out there yes if the pasta sauce has already been canned for generations there's no need to to fret if it's a recipe that's only been served you know for dinner and not put into a jar there are certain things that should be done to make sure the acidic value is high enough um, but most of the time, pasta sauces are primarily uh, tomatoes and high acid anyway. So water bathing that with just maybe a few simple adjustments by adding maybe some lemon juice and, um, you know, increasing the heat, uh, whether it be pressure canning or the time in the water bather, is, is all you need to do in order to um, make that shelf stable. Now, the new, you know, canners out there aren't going to know how to do that, but that's that's where I come in. You know, I can take a look at that recipe and find ways in which to enhance it to make it shelf stable. Fantastic. Now, your newest book is The Beginner's Guide to Canning. Um, what can readers expect from it? Is it good for new canners, old canners, well, uh, more experienced canners? What would you say? Well, I mean, that's a good question because when I wrote The Beginner's Guide to Canning, I wanted to appeal to those that were just getting started and were on the fence but just needed a little bit more knowledge or information. But as I started developing the book, I wanted it to also be available to those veteran canners, if you will. So it gives the newcomer all of the step-by-step -step instructions. It gives you the hows, the whys, the methodology behind it. Uh, the three things that I hinge on all three of my books is the three pillars of canning so that 
new canners and old can understand how we keep things safe. And so with this book, I expanded upon recipes. So I start simplistic. I even pulled in some vintage favorites, added some fun twists. Um, but I didn't rest on the laurels of just, you know, pickles and, and tomatoes. I did push it a little bit so that as the new canner got more confident, they could, they could have a lot more fun and, and they could get past, you know, the simple recipes as, you know, many beginners gravitate to. So you'll see things in there for soups and meals in a jar and even some fun, you know, chutneys and such. Well, let's talk about the new canner because uh, with the situation in the world right now, there's a lot of people growing and have grown their own food that never did before, and many people are taking the avenue of trying to preserve it. Uh, mm-hmm. What are some tips that you can give a new canner that is very uh, that would be a, uh, that are apprehensive? They're like, you want me to do what? Put this in the jar? And, <laughs> are you sure? I can do that. What do you mean? Exactly. I can do that <laughs> because oh, it's not. We, we only go. We only go get pasta sauce from the the store. You know that's yeah. that, that's how some people know what can, you know that type of thing. What would you? Uh, what could you advise or, or give new canners? Uh, what tips? Well, um, some of the the best things I tell new canners is to. Um, n- <laughs> We're in an information age, right? We have we have exposure to so much information that that in itself becomes overwhelming. So find some good groups on social media or my website, like canningdiva.com. Find a trusted place and and stick with that trusted place or that trusted uh, book or just even if it's just a fellow canner and and kind of shut out some of the other noise because you could get so much information that you wind up actually not doing a thing because you become overwhelmed. Um, second is to just start somewhere. And my and when I say that is if you eat it on a regular basis, then focus starting in that particular food group. Um, if salsa is your thing or you love pickles, start there. Don't start canning something you know you're not going to eat just for the sake of saying I've learned how to do something. Because what will happen is those jars will sit on your pantry shelf, they'll never get ate, and you're going to give up the craft altogether, right? Um, another thing I tell new canners is um, start with recipes that um, your family is going to enjoy that you are going to start utilizing in meal creation. So one of my recipes, basil diced tomatoes. I don't even make plain diced tomatoes anymore. I use basil diced tomatoes for everything. So when I say this to individuals, find something that once you get good at it, you know you're going to find other ways to use it because ultimately when we're now trying to be more prepared, okay, giving today's times, right. we can't just survive off of 50 jars of jam you know, or 70 jars of pickles, right, you know, right, we right. have to think past that, right? So think of things of, uh, think of things like soups and stews. Um, I've got some phenomenal recipes like chicken pot pie filling. Um, you can do beef bourguignon in a jar. Um, you can, you can break past, um, you know, barriers when you get into pressure canning. And when you see meat on sale, you can throw that in a jar and preserve it. And and now you're taking those savings into later months and still reaping the rewards. So I think it's tips like that that start getting canners, new canners, especially to be less apprehensive and realize how they can, um, you know, watch their grocery budget. They can extend you know, the, the savings throughout the year. And then they wind up having things that they know they're going to eat ready to go on their pantry shelf. Definitely. Now, how can our listeners find out your information? I know you mentioned your website a few times, but just remind us and so they can get your, sure. your books too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find me all over social media. Um, just type in the Canning Diva and I'm going to be there on Facebook and Twitter. I have a Pinterest, Instagram. I even have a YouTube channel. Uh, my website is canningdiva.com and then all of my books are sold on Amazon. Um, my second book was uh, The Complete Guide to Pressure Canning. That is also available on uh, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, Target. Um, the latest book, Beginner's Guide, is primarily on Amazon, but you'll start to see that more and more um, in other uh, storefronts as well. So, yep, type up the Canning Diva, and I'll, I'll get you pointed in the right direction. Well, Diane, we greatly appreciate you taking time and not only helping educate some of our new canners and our, and our listeners, as well as Holly and myself. Oh, you're welcome, and thank you for having me. You guys uh, have a wonderful uh, uh, fall here, and... Uh, 
Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Thank and, you. And when we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions. Yep, it's garden and answer time. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company designs greenhouses specifically built for the northern Midwest climate. All of their greenhouses are made to withstand heavy snow, and wind for years to come. They build freestanding and home-attached greenhouses for both commercial growers, schools, and backyard gardeners. Visit WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. For more information on pricing or to request a greenhouse catalog, go to WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Question and answer time. You've got a question. We can get it answered for you. Coast to coast, toll free. 1-800-927-SHOW. 1-800-927-SHOW. You can also send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Anytime, day or night for both of those. Our phone line's open 24-7 and the email as well. Had a number of questions come in this week. We'll see how many we can get through to the top of the hour, Holly. And just to let you know that uh, during our off season, next week will be our last episode of the uh, year. But we will have uh, both emails and phone numbers open for you to ask questions all year long so don't hesitate first question here holly comes uh let's see here i uh, from george i'm interested in growing indoors using grow bags i have a dry basement with an average temperature of 65 degrees and advice on lights would be nice uh, i wouldn't want lights but due to their cost uh, it can be challenged to find a good set of lights i have grown in deep water hydroponics but i would like an led light that would be cost effective. I am retired on a fixed income, so any leads and advice would be greatly appreciated. I am looking to grow broccoli, beets, potatoes, and maybe beans. Any advice? Thank you. And I listen to your show on Spotify. Well, George, thank you for listening to us. And here's what our advice would be. Um, and he grows at about 65 degrees. Yes. So we had said that the only thing out of all those that might be difficult would be the, the beans. beans. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we recommend the happy leaf LED. As you know, we do, we do really enjoy that, that LED. It has a ma- magnificent light spectrum. It has a nice footprint. Made in America. Ma- made in America. Last forever. Last forever. <laughs> Last a very long time. Yes. And we've talked to the owner and several times. The owner and inventor. Yeah. Owner and inventor. So the happy leaf is what we can use to grow. To, to use utilize for the light, sure. yeah. yeah. Now we can use the uh, the root maker grow bags uh, for the bags, and we can use a couple of different. If you're going to do hydroponics, you can use the water. If you're going to do in the soil, you can use a soilless mix, but you're going to have to add nutrients. If you're going to use a, a potting soil with a slow release fertilizer, 
You can do that, but you may inquire some fungal gnats issues. So that's something to be aware of, too. And there's different traps in which you can utilize uh, for that particular system and situation. But you can certainly do all of those, uh, as George wants to do, in the basement uh, over winter. So that certainly uh, works very, very well for, for that. Uh, next question comes in. Uh, what do we got here? I would like to pressure can apple juice. Um, I'm unable to find any information on how to do so. How could I do that? And that's from Marianne. Okay. And unfortunately, you there's you cannot pressure can apple juice that we know of. Apple juice is only canned for about five to ten minutes, depending uh-huh. on the the size of the jar. So um, it's uh, in a water bath canner. So I don't believe pressure canning is a is a thing for apple juice. I searched and searched, and I could only find water bath canning. Uh, so yeah, because of the acidity is so so uh, high, right? Right, and it's just it's just not a thing. It's and when you're processing something like a water bath canner for five minutes in pressure can, I think it'd probably like work out to thirty seconds or something. It wouldn't it wouldn't be worth it. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, here's another question uh, coming in from Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, no, is it? No, that's not right, is it? Chesla. Yeah, Chesla. Uh, see, I've discovered your show. I apologize if we butchered your name. I discovered your show this past July, and I really enjoy and look forward to listening to it each week. I'm in northeast Wisconsin, where we have had our first frost already, and the night before the frost, I went out and picked all the green tomatoes. Do you have any suggestions on ripening them indoors or recipes to utilize the green tomatoes? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for listening to our show, and Holly, you've got some suggestions for her. Yeah, definitely. So for one, um, when it comes to the, the green tomatoes, ripening them indoors, you just simply have to let time make it happen. They're not going to be as great as if they no. were ripened on the vine. No, but if you have a sunny area, maybe you can lay them out on a table. There are, you know, there's different methods you can find online. Right. You so can you put can, a banana or bananas in a bag and yeah, use them. Like the, newspaper. What is it? The ethanol that comes yeah. off of them will yeah. help ripen them. Obviously, it's not going to be like that's fresh July tomato, but that does work. You can, you can do, you can make, what'd you say? You can can them. Yeah. So you can make, there's different green salsas. There's different, uh, fried green tomatoes, uh, stuffed green tomatoes. Some people don't of- grow tomatoes for the ripeness. They grow it for the green tomatoes. Yeah. So they, and, okay. But now to me, they're kind of sour and bitter. Right. So I would just let them ripen. And then I would usually like a lot of times make like a, a fresh pico de gallo. I mean, you could can them. Okay. That's for people too. like me who, who are not familiar with what pico de mayo pico, is. Pico de gallo. Yes. It's like a fresh salsa. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I would do that at, and just add a bit more, um, lime juice or something to it but you could also you you could can them once they do ripen and then that would help develop more of the flavor or when you can them once they ripen you can then use them like a chili where you're adding spices anyway and cooking it down. so once they ripen indoors for her it is okay to go ahead and can them even though they were started out green i mean Correct. You can. There's no. You just do. Would you have to worry about the acidity being? No. S- since they're they started green and people they, people okay. buy store bought tomatoes and can with them. Okay. Well, I'm just saying with them being green and the 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 indoor ripening procedure being slow and everything. I just wanted to make sure that right. for people who are maybe questioning that uh, me- method of uh, such to to do such. Um, um, so there you go on that. Um, well, we are almost out of time. We got a time for one more question, Holly. Uh, what, when we've had this question come in uh, several times, so we're going to answer it again. What is the recommended time frame to use flat lid jars, the flat portions of the jars? I've gotten some old ones from a thrift store, and with a so- shortage in our area for canning lids, is it okay to use some? These are definitely older than the last couple of decades. You're probably, they're probably all going to fail. It's usually about five years. Okay. Um, so what happens is that rubber that's in there, it the, gets, the gasket thing, the gasket thing, yeah. it's, um, it's just going to dry rot. So unfortunately you could use them for dry storage, uh-huh. you know, just put them on a jar. Maybe you put some lentils or something in a jar, put them on that jar with your, your ring. But as far as, um, as canning with them, you're not going to have success. And now, where we're at here, and, and it's no mystery, we're in southeast Wisconsin. Holly, have we, we've, I don't think we've seen the shortage or the, of canning jars and canning items as, uh, other portions of the country have seen. I don't, I personally don't 
think so either. I st- I've I went and bought kind of think it's more of a regional thing. Some lids, yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's because of where we live exactly, yeah. what city. Maybe people out here don't can as much, but who knows? I don't know. Well, that being said, we are out of time, and we. Thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of this show today or you want to revisit it? You can certainly do that by doing a couple of different things. You can go to our website and searching the Season 4 tab at the top of the page and looking in chronological order all the shows in which we've done this year. You can also search page 1 or the radio radio Season 1, 2, and 3 there to catch up. Uh, You can also send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and we will send you the link for this show. You can also find it in in in-studio form as well and in garden videos. We have plenty of those. Tell your friends and tell your family that this program's on the air. We have one more show left and that's next week, end of season four. We've done this four years now, which is incredible. We're self-funded and uh, we'll tell you we got some thank yous to give out next week. We're also going to talk about some things in which We wish we would have done in our garden this year that we didn't do that we'll do next year, as well as our guest will be author of Complete Container Gardening, uh, Complete Container Herb Gardening. Susan Gortiz will be with us and we'll thank a bunch of people. So if you got questions, certainly send them in. We'll get them answered for you. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird and we will see you in the garden.